Uh, well, as she said, I'm just a little bit about myself. I got my start uh, getting my PhD in Eastern Mediterranean stuff, which is how I got into Islamic. I did my dissertation at uh, on a topic on a manuscript at St. Catherine's Monastery. This is the location where the burning bush was supposed to be, but if you've ever been there, you know the miracle is not that the bush was burning, but that there was a bush at all. <laughs> uh, it, it makes Utah look like the Cambodian rainforest by comparison. Uh, so I, I, I got to work, I got to stay in that room right there. Uh, unfortunately, because of my attire, the, the Russian pilgrims were there, nicknamed me uh, Capella to Indiana Jones. <laughs> so I got to work on this, this fabulous manuscript here. Uh, what I do at UVU now is I teach non-Western art, um, which is the whole world, <laughs> which was a very daunting subject. And uh, it's kind of problematic for my students because when I bring up something like, say, the Islamic world and the Ottoman Empire, and I mentioned the Ottoman world, um, all they fundamentally know about it is an Ottoman, uh, which is unfortunate <laughs> because you may not know this, but uh, the Ottomans also invented the sofa, the coffee table, and popularized coffee as well. <laughs> so, which gets more laughs here than usual in Amtau Valley because of the, uh, the uh, religious contingent that we're in. And this is some of these things that I really love, is that we don't recognize that many of the common things that we have, we get from other cultures. Cultures. Um, sofa is an Arabic word that means wool or cushion. Uh, divan, which is you know a, div a divan or a French word for couch, comes from the Persian diwan, which means anteroom, council, a kind of informal gathering. These were anterooms that people would have uh, placed in front of the palace so they could sit there and sip coffee and have wonderful co you know conversations. So virtually everything about your modern living room actually comes from the Ottomans, with the exception of the TV. That's American. So, uh, we can, you know, really, it's important to know how your culture frames this. The Ottomans very much loved informal conversation, etc., and so the entire living room was built around it. And when Europeans got to the Ottoman Empire and discovered, holy crap, uh, this is a lot more comfortable than sitting on high back chairs, uh, it all came over into the European sphere as a kind of uh, very much appreciated cultural appropriation. And what I'm really trying to get at this is that a chair is never a just a chair. All a chair has to do is to keep your butt off the ground, and yet chairs reflect what our aspirations and our culture is. We have a shaker chair on the one side. The shaker was a religion that valued utilitarian furniture, simplicity, and so they're known for these very simple but very sturdy, elegant chairs, whereas the throne of Napoleon over here wishes to express more than simplicity, mm -hmm. uh, wishes to express power, projection, and of course there's an infinite range in between that exists. And if there's any group of people that can appreciate that a chair is not a chair, it's going to be geeks. Um, <laughs> they understand this. I mean, we live in a world where Art Deco means dwarves and Art Nouveau means elves, and we instantly kind of associate cultures with visual ways, with visual um, kind of folk ways. So as we get to world building, I find it very important um, to conceive of how does your culture think? What is the visual culture of your uh, imaginary or fictionary, uh, fictional world? One of my favorite ways of describing this is we can divide it up into material culture. Material culture is the total sum of a, of a culture's production, your utilitarian objects, your coat, your chair, uh, anything that has to be made in a factory or by hand. And then there's visual culture. Visual culture is how the world sees itself and involves their religion, their society, gender, ethnicity, all of these other issues. Art is the fun little thing in the middle of this Venn diagram because it's a material object that shows the visual culture. And that's really critically important. So a chair is never a chair. A building is never a building. It's a kind of expression of the culture that created it. And so I'm hoping that I'm going to pull out a few examples here, and that these examples will help you think about your own cultures and your own fictional uh, worlds, and think, how do they think? And then how they think will then determine the settings and the props and the objects that you're going to have them employ. 
uh, I happen to do this from the backside. I'm an art historian, so we start at the object and go back to the culture to try to figure it out. But I think it could work just as equally the other way, that you start imagining, and this uh, it can be extrapolated out. So if you really want to break this up, we have the world of ideas and objects. So let me go back to a chair. We're sticking with our chair example. This is one of my all-time favorite chairs, and not just because it's a lovely object uh, with lapis lazuli, turquoise, carnelian, gold, etc., uh, but because of what it says. This is the golden throne of Tutankhamun. This was found in his tomb. And if we look at this back of the chair, the chair actually has a scene of a person sitting in a chair. So this is chairception. Uh, and it's actually important. What you see is the three-feathered crown up here is the crown of Osiris. And these are the horns of Hathor, which are often associated with the goddess Isis. So Tutankhamun is being anointed. He has a collar stand over here. And she is anointing his collar Perfume represents the presence of deity, or the presence of a god. So he, as the pharaoh, represents the nexus between his people and the afterlife. And so he takes on the mantle of Osiris, the god of the dead. And she takes on the mantle of Isis, his consort, and therefore anoints him. And this is an investiture ceremony. And an investiture ceremony is something that recognizes your authority. This was a ritual that Egyptians had to do every day. So when we see this scene on this chair, the chair becomes more than a chair. It becomes this symbol of authority. And we can probably guess that this is the chair that that event actually took place in. So it's a reflection of their aspirations um, and the reflection of the belief that Tutankhamun could serve as a kind of stand-in or a proxy for the god so that they could have access to the afterlife. Here's another one of my favorite examples. This is from a medieval tradition, um, and that's the concept of heaven. Uh, I don't know where we get the modern conventional view of heaven, where it looks like a kind of white suburban gated community in the clouds. Um, but that's not how Christians viewed it. Christians viewed heaven as a city, a glorious golden city with foundations and made out of gems. When they talk about the pearly gates, yeah, that's not like a gate covered with pearls. That's a gigantic pearl carved into a gate, a size of a city gate. Really impressive stuff. And so we have a completely different view of that. But one of the things that fascinates me the most about heaven is heaven is a cube. It is four square. And in a tradition reminiscent of the holy hand grenade of Antioch, they tell you how to do it 14 <laughs> different times. Breath is equal, et cetera. So definitely it's a square. Yeah, we know what a square is. So heaven, the heaven in the end, the heavenly Jerusalem, is the eschatological state. It's the final state where Christians hope to go. And so it is a cube. And a cube is a kind of perfect, regular, one of the reg regular platonic solids. So it existed in scripture for centuries before people actually started drawing it here. This is how you draw a cube in the Middle Ages. Uh, it's before the invention of perspective. So they laid out the cube flat, so the gates are on all sides. So that's a, a weird kind of way to depict a cube, but it's how they saw a cube. And what's really interesting is that even something as simple as this square can tell you an enormous amount about their culture. I was first introduced to this by Stephen Murray. Stephen Murray uh, was a guy, British Oxford accent, fantastic guy, but his favorite thing to do was to dress up in leathers and drive his Harley around America in the summers go around with his sons, fantastic guy, but he was also an expert in Gothic architecture, worked at Columbia University. And he noticed that the proportions of a Gothic cathedral were all laid out on this same double square. Remember, the double square is a kind of a cube, at least in medieval understanding. That you would take the diagonal of that, and this would give you the length of the nave. It would give you the length of the transept. It would give you the length of the choir and the sanctuary. And so everything about the church is actually laid out on that square. And so when we get there, it's just kind of beautiful architecture. But when a Christian from the Middle Ages would arrive, he would see a lot more than just a square. He would see a kind of representation of heaven. The church is supposed to represent the kingdom of God on earth. And so you going into it is like going into heaven. And so when you see the square framed in the 
uh, transept above you, this is not an accident. And it's really interesting how even subtle details in culture like this can impact the shape and formation of a building. One of my other favorite examples of this from the Middle Ages is how you read sculpture or how you were meant to interact with the architecture and the sculpture around you. This is Rolls Cathedral, um, and it has one of the most magnificent monumental gates, um, monumental kind of portals uh, in all of the high uh, Gothic world. And we're gonna talk about just these figures here. These are called jam figures, because this is the door jam. So these are jam, J-A-M-B. And we have a collection of them there. Now this church is dedicated to the Virgin Mary, and you have uh, a couple of pairs of figures. You have the Virgin Mary, the angel Gabriel, and then you have the Virgin Mary again. In this case, you have Elizabeth. So this is the Annunciation, where the Virgin Mary is told that she's going to be the mother of Christ. And this is Mary when she goes to meet uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. John the Baptist leaps in her womb. She uses this as evidence that Mary is going to be the mother of Christ, etc. And when this happens, they all go into a kind of reverie. Now, if you were reading this in the modern world, you would think this is perfectly OK, because we read left um, to right. but. Remember, this is on the door of a church, and you're coming into the church. And most people at this time are, in fact, illiterate. So they don't read left to right or right to left or any way. So you would actually read this as this wonderful, uh, very sophisticated animation demonstrates uh, from the other direction. <laughs> and so as you come into the door, now that's a problem because the visitation happens after the Annunciation. So why have they reversed the order in this case? And this was a real problem for art historians for a long time until somebody not in art history, somebody smart, actually figured it out. Uh, there was a musicologist by the name of Margot Fassler. And she realized the way that people interacted with their architecture was not through narratives or stories, but through the way they understood those stories, which at the time was music. It was music and ritual. And one of the most important early songs at the time was the Canticle of Mary. It has roots in the Magnificat. And as it turns out, it quotes the Visitation first and the Annunciation second. So suddenly, this thing which seemed to be in the wrong order is in the right order if you're thinking of it as a song. This is a hymn or a prayer in stone. As your average medieval Christian would come into this space, they would see this on their right hand, they would see the scene, and they would immediately conjure up the scripture of what they were supposed to be seeing, and that this was the source of the Canticle of Mary, and then they would repeat, either out loud or in their hearts, the Canticle of Mary, and then they'd have another mnemonic device here to let them know the next part. So you say this. This is never something is just decoration. It responds to the way you understand the world. And for Christians, that's the way you understood the world, is you understood it through your daily rituals, your daily prayers, the hymns that you said. You didn't have a Bible to read, but you did have songs and hymns and prayers. So it works perfectly well. It's a really wonderful example of how this works. Now, I wouldn't be a non-Western guy if I didn't jump into some other non-Western examples, so let me do a few. One of the things that really separates people from studying non-Western art is they come with Western expectations. For Westerners, art is big, it's monumental, it hangs on the wall, uh, it has a big golden frame around it. But for most of Chinese history, art is small. It's in hand scrolls that are rolled up and are only taken out to show it close little soirees and parties. It's much more like the way people collect uh, you know, comic books, uh, although my friends would never let me get them out of the mylar. So it's a, it's, a, it's a conservator's art. It is a connoisseur's art. It's supposed to be small and intimate. So the paintings are more small and intimate. But one of my favorite things is, is that it likes this idea that the work has had a history to it. So when you look at Chinese uh, scholastic painting, there's almost always going to be poem and calligraphy. And then there's these things. These are yin seals. You have a chop that makes your seal. This is your signature. 
So when you come into ownership of this thing, you stamp it. And can you imagine somebody buying a Rembrandt and every person who ever owned it, you know, kind of signing their name to it? It's kind of a Western idea that's completely alien. But to the Chinese idea, this gives this added value and continual worth. Um, and then they also go a little farther that they'll add colophons. They will add whole sections where they will write their own poems and their own reverie about how inspiring this thing is. So this thing was made in the 8th century. And it has a very, very long history to it. Uh, in fact, so if we start at the original, uh, you can see the beginning of the colophon. Uh, and then there's the next page, next page. Uh, not done yet. Not quite. Not done. There we are. Um, we have over, oops, and one more. Uh, so wait. <laughs> And what? <laughs> so we have over 25 feet of colophons. This thing was owned by four emperors, dozens of magistrates. We know its entire history from the 8th century right up until the 19th century when it was bought by a private collector and then sold to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which doesn't have a stamp on it uh, because we're from the West. But it would be cool. <laughs> so this idea of valuing something because it has a history is very, very different than the West, but it's very much part of their tradition. Another thing that's really cool about Chinese scholastic painting is that it's not about history. If you're looking at painting, particularly painting in the Western world, it's going to be important people, important events, gods, goddesses, Christians, um, you know, saints, um, those kind of things. Instead, what we get is a lot of landscapes. And you'll notice that the people down here, like the little fishermen villages, uh, are little teeny itty bitty things. And again, this has to do with culture. Uh, China has this thing that they call the three doctrines, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. I'm going to talk about Taoism. Taoism is a very slim uh, kind of book. And it's a very aggravating book because the first line of it says, the way that can be named is not the true way. Mm -hmm. That's what Taoism means. It means the way. And so it's how to find this natural intuitive path. But guess what? We can't tell you what it is, so good luck. Um, but it's <laughs> fun because one of the things it stresses is your own nothingness that man is nothing, and that we take our cues instead from nature. And so you're not going to see really monumental pictures. You'll see the, the emperor, of course. But you're going to see things like this, where a little itty bitty human being, gesture of a landscape, cloud, <laughs> where we have a depiction of nothingness, um, where most of the picture is not there because it reveals this idea. I love this love of nature. This is one of my favorite Chinese objects ever. This is an incense burner. And what you see is you put the coals down here, the top goes on. And when the incense burns, it comes up through these beautiful, very stylized, almost Dr. Seussian mountains. And it ushers out. Well, they're deliberately trying to evoke the natural landscape of China itself. Uh, where you have these mountains rising out of mist. So a lot of their art is going to reflect nature and this putting man secondary to nature. One of the other ways that things can be different is one of my favorite things, typography and calligraphy. We tend to label things like calligraphy minor arts, which is a kind of subtle way of saying not as important as the fine arts. Um, we do this to things like knitting, crocheting, textiles, all kinds, silverware. We just kind of put them in a second category. That's a very Western view. But in the Islamic world, calligraphy is the highest form of art. Because in the Judeo-Christian tradition, God speaks and creation is made. Uh, in the Islamic tradition, God picks up the kalam, the pen, and he writes and creation is made. And so there's an emphasis on the written word. So what you're seeing here is what would have been the most valued possession of a Persian prince. It's a scrapbook. We're in Utah. We've got to appreciate scrapbooks. Um, and what we have are pasted in pieces of epigrams and poems written by all these different calligraphers that he was absolutely in love with. And it's still true today. There's still a vibrant kind of uh, you know, calligraphy tradition in, as well. That's not something we would see in the West. And so the arts are going to be book arts. They're going to be smaller arts. They're not going to be big wall murals or 
other kind of paintings. One of my favorite things is religion and how religion impacts um, art and art traditions. One of the more interesting, I think, is something that comes out of uh, the Buddhist and Hindu world, which is this concept of sas samsara, which is literally wanderings, but it means this endless change or flow. Uh, so what you're seeing here is Shiva. Shiva is all commonly known as the destroyer. Uh, so it's a famous line from the Bhagavad Gita is what um, Oppenheimer quoted when he saw the atomic bomb go off, which is actually kind of odd because it makes, I mean, when we say destroyer, we instantly conjure up sinister ideas in the Western world. But that's not the case. This is a positive image. Um, so here we have Lord of the Dance. Sorry, uh, Michael Flatley. Um, <laughs> here he is, and we have the fires of destruction. He holds the Anni, the sacred fire, in his hand, and he treads on the demon Mara, ignorance or evil, and he brings about a new creation. So you have to have this endless flow of destruction, recreation, creation, maintenance, and then destruction again. And if we stop that, then it stops the destruction of evil and the, the rebirth. So that's a very different idea than the Western idea, where we're kind of moving towards a permanent state, where we are seeking a kind of permanent, you know, kind of perfect state. Uh, probably my favorite expression of this is going to be the mandalas of Tibet. Uh, these are cosmological diagrams. They are maps designed to help you find um, your own enlightenment. Um, and they're loosely based on, again, architecture, and they influence architecture. This is a stupa. Uh, this is one of them here. So this is a stupa. This is in uh, modern-day Indonesia. And the whole building is kind of created. Uh, Mount Meru is this mythical mountain in the Tibetan concept. And so the stupa kind of stands in for Mount Meru, this kind of uh, state of enlightenment. And it's surrounded by smaller stupas. Um, and so you have this kind of creation in physical architecture of what we see in this example. But my favorite expression of this is Tibetan sand painting, where they have these tiny little sticks that have little ridges on them and a little groove. And if you strum those grooves, the sand will flow out just a few grains of sand at a time. And slowly, you can see they have masks, so they don't, you sneeze, you don't ruin a month's work. Um, and you can see how they build up even texture and relief. Um, they're absolutely phenomenally beautiful. And all of this effort is done in the service of a ritual. And when the ritual is done, it is swept up. Uh, it is placed into a bowl. And then, depending on the circumstances, it is poured into water. Or sometimes, if you're on a mountain, it will be spread out onto the wind. Um, and it's gone. <laughs> It's utterly destroyed. It exists for the ritual and nothing else, which is alien to a kind of Western view of the idea of permanence. But if you believe in this samsara, that thing has fulfilled its purpose, and now it can be swept up and tidily uh, finished once it's satisfied the ritual. One of the more interesting ways uh, that culture can express itself is in anaconism. So icon means image. And so if you were allowed images of gods, you have icons of gods. But there are also this whole tradition of anaconism, where you don't show gods because they're too sacred. This should be fairly you know, comfortable to us, because according to the second commandment uh, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, I uh, shall have no images, have no other gods before me. But this one is one of my favorites. In the early tradition of Buddhism, you were not allowed to show depictions of the Buddha. So you showed the Buddha by what he left behind. In this case, it's Buddhapada. It's Buddha's footprints. Uh, and in the footprints, we have lotus blossoms. We also have the, um, the Trimurti, this kind of emblem of Buddhism, which represents the three jewels of Buddhism as well. So you don't represent it. You represent it by what's left behind. Probably one of the strongest traditions of anaconism is the Islamic world. Now, Muslims have a vibrant narrative, illustrative tradition. They are, despite what people think, they are allowed to illustrate uh, things. But they're never allowed to show images of God, or they're never allowed to have images of physical things inside a mosque or a religious object, or like in a, in a building, religious building, or in a, in a Quran. Never in a Quran. 
So you're left with the problem is how do you show the presence of God? And the way you show presence of God is you show his mastery. One of the simplest ways is, of course, calligraphy, which we've seen before, this beautiful calligraphy. But the other is these complicated geometry and arabesques. We see this over here. So you have this alphys. This is this border with the inscription here. And then we have this complicated, beautiful geometric um, constructions. This is the carpet pages or the front uh, the frontispieces to an Islamic Quran. This one comes from the Mamluk period and it has all of the features there. So we have calligraphy, we have all this wonderful Arabic um, arabesques in a vine scroll, we have all this beautiful interlacing geometric ornament. And then we also get fabulous things like these mukarnas. So the question then becomes how, why? Why are we have these things? Well, if you can't show God, you have to show his mastery. One of the things that uh, Muslims really were good at was mathematics. We have this thing called algebra for a reason. Um, and you have geometers. Everybody, he everybody hear about um, you know, Omar Khayyam? Anybody familiar with that? Yeah, we know him as a poet, but he was actually a ge geometer. And his fam most famous book in the Muslim world was a geometry for artists, because he was really sick to death of artists doing pat poor geometry. Uh, and Ibn al-Hatham, who was this writer on a book of optics, argued that the complexity of geometry, it seems overwhelmingly complex at first view, but as you get closer into detail, it starts to make sense. And this is a representation of the creation and the representation of the sovereignty of Allah, of God, that he is everywhere but nowhere, um, he is infinitely complex but also kind of infinitely simple. Well, what am I, 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 I got to get to some of the more interesting and unusual examples, uh, and those are some of the ones that I'm really studying now, which is from the pre-Columbian world. One of the hardest things for my students to wrap their head around is the bloodletting and sacrifice that's very present uh, everywhere in the Mesoamerican field. Uh, but I think that if you understand it, the Mayans believed that the world was, again, a series of creations. The gods, um, you have grandfather sky, grandmother earth. They have three iterations of creations. They make men out of mud but the men have no sense and they dissolve into the water so that they cannot worship them. Then they make creatures out of wood, um, but they're like robots and they have no care for the environment or for the gods, so they wipe them out in a gigantic flood of tree resin, except for the few that save and become spider monkeys. And then they finally come along and they make man out of maize, out of corn, because corn is the bread of life in the Mesoamerican world, and then they also make him out of blood so that he has a spark of the gods in him himself. And these can justly worship um, the gods, but the gods need their worship because the gods create the universe. They're in a constant battle to maintain the universe. So they have to be resupplied with life. And so you'll see things like, in this case, Lady Shock, she is running a cord a barbed cord through her tongue. She's not a piercing fetishist. Uh, she's doing this to get blood, and the blood would then be spread on bark paper that would then be burned. Uh, in the Mayan world, anything that writhes like smoke or water or blood is personified as a serpent. So the serpent comes out and the mouth opens, and here is the ancestor that has been replenished and recreated from this offering of blood. So, and this was something that was expected of kings and queens and nobles, that you had to do this. Uh, quite frankly, the queens are getting off easy. Uh, men had another method. Uh, they used a, a stingray a stinger uh, and were piercing another part of anatomy, which um, I don't have to say because I'm already seeing men cringing. <laughs> One of my favorite examples also that, that demonstrates this and the concept of how death brings about new life comes from the tomb of Lord Pakal and this absolutely gorgeous, gigantic sarcophagus lid. It's a little bit hard to see, so I've got a drawing here. So at the bottom, we have this fabulous mask that we call a Huitz monster. And it represents the earth, and it's kind of personified as a beetle. So these are beetle mandibles. And so we have the Huitz mask right there. 
And then there is Lord Pakal himself. Uh, no, he's not an ancient astronaut. Uh, he is actually uh, a Mayan king. And so he is being eaten by the Earth. He is being consumed. But out of his middle grows the Mayan world tree. And the Mayan world tree is a kind of a weird cross-shaped structure that's a mix of a ceiba tree, uh, which is this spiky uh, tree, and also corn. Uh, and then it has a serpent. Um, this is the Mishkuatl in the Nahuatl. I forget what the Mayan word is at the top of my head. But this is the cloud serpent, and the cloud serpent is the Milky Way. So this is the tree branching through the Milky Way. And then finally, we have a rain or maize deity at the top. So Pakal's death bring, brings forth the birth of the world tree and renews the world tree in this creation. This is something we see a lot in the pre-Columbian world. Uh, this is one of my favorite rulers, who his name in Mayan is Yakshaklakajun Ubak Akawil, but I'll only refer to him as 18 Rabbit from this time on. Uh, <laughs> for non-obvious reasons, here is that same beetle face Wheats monster, and in this case, it's consuming him, making him look like he's standing in a cave, like he's in the mouth to the underworld. But he himself is immersed in all of this vegetation that is growing from him, and again, you can see the cross-shaped world tree. His death brings about the renewal of the world. Uh, they believed so much in this idea of the earth being a monster that consumes that the doors to their temples are actually shaped like mounds. So here's an eye, here's an eye, here's teeth, here's this kind of terrifying grin, here's these teeth here. So you actually walk up onto the lower jaw and the tongue of the monster entering into the temple because you are being eaten. Because to pass into the underworld is like to pass below the grave. Um, and finally, you know, maybe one of the more extreme versions is the Aztec. I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but this idea of rebirth, uh, this is Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli is the national deity of the Aztecs, and he wields the Shukuatl, the, the fire serpent. But it's blue, so he's not a Sith, so you know he's OK. Um, <laughs> and he is born out of the neck of Coatepec. So this is the Earth goddess. Uh, not Coatepec, excuse me, Coatlique. Coatepec is where it happens. That's the location. So Guatawike is the earth goddess, and she doesn't have a serpent head. What's happening here is that she becomes pregnant by Huitzilopochtli, this kind of strange rebirth process, and her own children have, see her as a source of shame because she got pregnant, um, and they go to cut off her head and cut off her hands. And again, serpents represent blood, and so these, these two serpents that come together in the wonderful world of Aztec design face forward as well as face each other. And out of the bloody stump emerges Huitzilopochtli, who then becomes the founder of the Mexica people and leads them to Lake Texcoco. So rather disturbing image, but again, it's this representation of life. And then he um, cuts apart his sister, um, and then by cutting her apart, the segmented body throws her down. And so she becomes the moon, he becomes the sun, which is why her stone is located right there at the bottom of the pyramid, because when they sacrifice their victims, the dismembered bodies would be thrown down in emulation. So every time a sacrifice happens, it's like a recreation of the universe with the moon and the sun and the stars. Uh, her brothers get slaughtered and get thrown to the stars. So you have, uh, that's a rather extreme example, but a really fun example as well. I did want to talk a little bit about um, a word of caution with this. If you look at these cultures, they bear excellent sources uh, for resource material. And there's a lot of discussion about uh, this problem of culture and cultural appropriation, which is something I'm very sensitive to. Because if you just Google the word harem in an image search, uh, well, first you're going to get mostly anime and then uh, a bunch of other things that maybe that's your thing, maybe it's not. I'm not judging, but I don't do it. Uh, because you're going to get these sexualized images of nudes in Islamic contexts, which can kind of be uh, a little negative, because if you know the Islamic concept of harem, harem just means the part of the house that's the domestic residence. And so when you see Islamic views of harems, they show loving families, not 
nude, eroticized females. So we have to be careful that we do represent these cultures accurately, and this is something I think Mormons can appreciate uh, because of this wonderful thing. Uh, this is a, a movie from 1917, a silent film that talked about virginal young women that were abducted and secreted uh, under tunnels uh, into Utah. So, I can never find these at Beehive Clothing, but anyhow. <laughs> um, so, so there are negative examples, but I want to say that there are positive examples too. Um, Christians who were often at war with Muslims would put elaborate uh, Islamic textiles under the feet of the Virgin Mary. And yet this is a, a uniquely Muslim object. This is a prayer niche. This is a wudu fountain. So this is a representation of a mosque in itself. Sometimes Christians would copy these so accurately, they loved them so much, that they would include um, the script, and the script would say the Shahada. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet, which I'm pretty sure is not something you want to put over the head of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> um, but it shows that this is not motivated by a religious response, it's motivated by an aesthetic response. And again, we have these beautiful Persian manuscripts. Um, this whole thing here is about five inches wide. Uh, so when you see the detail here. But this is a fusion of Islamic art that never would have happened had the Mongols not brought Chinese scholastic painting with them into the Persian world. So uh, my, my word on this is ad advice to writers, etc., is don't be afraid. Um, as long as you are researched, as long as you are doing things with respect, um, use these resources. Get them out there. Um, I would love to see more Mayan fiction uh, and uh, more Islamic fiction, and I think that it can be done uh, respectfully, and you can create just really wonderful and vast uh, and beautiful settings if you think first about how does this culture think and how that impacts their society um, and their art. Thank you. minutes. Do we have some questions? Let's take the joker in the back. <laughs> um, so I, it was, this was a question kind of about the uh, Tibetan sand paintings. Um, since one of the purposes, like one of the like, symbolic values is the destruction, how do they feel about picture painting? Like, well, they they, uh, official response? there's actually been a change in opinion, um, and it has to do with it has to do with the Tibetan exile. That is that this was not something that was done in front of Westerners pre-1959. Right. It just wasn't. There's a few Westerners that documented it, etc. Um, but because China occupied Tibet, because the Dalai Lama fled to India, and these, and you now have Tibetan monks spread all over the world, uh, there's a large number of Tibetan monasteries in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what's happened now is m Buddhists are very much an evangelical faith. They proselytize. They wished people to uh, learn the Dharma. And so one of the best ways they found to teach that to people is through public presentation. And so you know, some, they will do these now in shopping malls. Uh, they did one at the Freer and Sackler Gallery that I got to watch, and some little kid went and jumped on it. They had to take him off, and the Buddhists were very Buddhist. And they just you know, kindly escorted him off and had a conversation with him. And, and that was, they, they didn't mind, and they started over, and they did it. So they're now, the, the, it has been a change, because now they see it as an excellent tool for proselyting. But that's a modern thing. That's a very good point. Culture does change, and, and, and things that were you know, not secret before are, are now um, you know, open. So with things like this, what are good sources to do actual research? Because you can't usually just Wikipedia this and get the results you're looking for. So I mean, that, that's the thing. I am not an expert in so many fields. So what you have to do is look into experts. And actually, Wikipedia is good about anything that is non-controversial. Um, because they often have sources, and you can find those sources. Uh, Islam is unfortunately one of those topics that it's very hard to get good information on. If you're looking for grounding in Islamic art, um, my favorite sources are in architecture are Richard Eddinghausen, um, Oleg and Oleg Grabar. Uh, Oleg Grabar um, was kind of a seminal theorist in Islamic art and uh, decoration. Uh, if you're looking for stuff in, in the pre-Columbian world, we talked about this in the folklore uh, thing, the Popova, which is this 
uh, original source, original document, P-O-P-O-L, um, V-U-H, uh, and then also the Florentine Codex, which is this wonderful ethnographic history made in the 16th century about all of the cult and tradition of the Aztecs. I mean, everything, from how they dyed their cloth to what festivals they did, their schooling and education. So there are primary sources out there. So yeah, um, look, to, look to primary sources. Um, the, the better you look to primary sources, you can't really understand Hinduism unless you get into the Mahabharata and some of these traditions. And that's the best way to do it, oftentimes, rather than doing some secondary source. Um, question? What is the name of the Arabic geometrist you mentioned? Oh gosh, uh, well there's Omar Khayyam, the, well they're all geometrists, they're all polymaths, they all do math, they all do poetry, they all do science, they're these amazing people that make me inferior. Um, uh, the, one that, the one that I think is most important for visual culture is Ibn al-Hatham, who really is the foundational expert on optics. All modern that? optics is pretty much, bit, what? How do you spell that? Um, I-B-N, A-L, H-A-Y, T-H-A-M is how they spell it, but it's Arabic, so you know, uh, Arabic has four K sounds, so depending on how you want to translate it, K or Q or KH, it, it varies. But that should get you into the ballpark. I would also say that um, uh, Gloria, um, is it uh, Valeras? Uh, I can't remember her name, but she wrote, writes a fantastic book on Islamic aesthetics, uh, because Muslims actually do write a great deal about aesthetics and why we do this. Huh? Um, Wait, 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 wait! I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I've got my. It's 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 Valerie Gonzalez. I I I I flipped it. I think it's Valerie Gonzalez. Don't quote me on that. But you can send me an email. My email is tclark at uh, ubu.edu. And you know, if you if you want to talk art history, I'll turn on the fire hose. So feel free to, you know, and I'm I'm happy to do that. Oh, yes. I'm Valerie Gonzalez. On, yeah. I'm struggling how to like. Uh, but when I think about like Ireland and Persia, I think about two places with their very own strong and distinct culture. Yes. That existed prior to the uh, emergence of, of Christianity in Ireland or Islam within Persia. And, and so I'm wondering to what degree, uh, like, like, if there are anything that's like sort of characteristic about like, hey, Persia retained this in their architecture. Oh, um, the, absolutely. Um, the, the Sasanian Empire is destroyed in 744, but after that, you have this massive influx of Persian culture into the Islamic world. Most Islamic experts regard Persia as a kind of co-founder of modern Islamic civilization. And then if you go, especially after the fall of Baghdad in 1258, Persia becomes the main center of Islamic civilization. Uh, and if you know anything, the Shahnama is the great epic poem of the Islamic world, and it's written by Al-Fadarsi in the 8th century, but it's entirely about pre-Islamic myth. It's all about pre-Islamic tradition. What was the name of that? The Shahnama, the Book of Kings. Yeah. It's their epic, it's their epic myth. Yeah, I think it's interesting, because even today, there are distinctly Persian non-Islamic oh, yeah. things that are distinctly Celtic non-Christian things. Yeah, um, yeah, there's, clearly. There's very few cultures that have done that, but they've retained that sort of pretty yeah, they've maintained the, the tradition across. And then, there's, and then there's Mexico, which like I said earlier, Mexico doesn't really change styles, it just piles the new style on top of the old style. Um, and it just makes beautiful stuff. There are, there are Islamic themes, there are pre-Columbian themes. Um, you know, 17, 16th century, 17th century um, colonial architecture is just amazing. Anything else? Quick question. So bringing this to like modern science fiction and fantasy, what are some great examples of authors who um, draw inspiration from art history and do it really well? Uh, well, I was on a panel the other day, Frank Herbert Dune. Um, I think yeah. he, he really, he does both pre-Columbian and Islamic, um, you know, ideas, and he really does create that kind of depth. And so Dune's my Bible on those kind of things, uh, because I think he does it better than anybody any else. And I think a lot of people who try to get that kind of depth you know, look to him. Um, there's also, I mean, Tolkien is the one example, but Tolkien's largely been overtread because it's largely European. But without Tolkien, we wouldn't have these cliches. So you know, he's the other example, but the classic example. Who lives in the Pacific Northwest? Huh? Yeah, who lives in the Pacific Northwest? 
No. Not that I'm aware of. He's <laughs> <laughs> in Burbank. Burbank. That's, That's where Burbank. he is. Burbank. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I do have time. Oh, okay. So which one are you? He's the evil twin. Uh, he's the evil twin. Uh, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>